Welcome back to our next episode of What's Up Prof. First off, we would like to thank our members that help us to produce these videos and keep them free on YouTube. Thank you very much. And if you would like to become a member, you can follow the instructions down in the links that we provide below. Hello, Walter. Hi. It's nice to see you again. And we've had some comments in our previous video, videos that were mentioning Bible translations. And you've been on the carpet a few times because of your views on the Bible translations. Now, there's also been um, people saying that you are a King James only man. And I would like to discuss all of these issues with you in this episode. But would you please pray for us and open this because it's necessary to have the work of the Holy Spirit with us. Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And therefore it is important that we tread softly when it comes to this issue. And therefore I pray that you will be with us and enlighten us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, you said I was a King James only man. Well, let me put it quite pertinently. I'm not a King James only man. I'm a received text only man. There's a vast difference because there are numerous translations out there in the world that are based on the received text. And so, uh, what was the Bible that uh, Martin Luther wrote? Yes. Oh, by the way, there's a beautiful example on the shelf over there of that massive Bible of Martin Luther's. And it's old and moldy and so full of beautiful pictures and things. It's, it's a wonderful word. That's based on the received text. So how can I be a King James only person if uh, There's that such a beautiful Bible, Bible was written in my mother tongue? <laughs> so let's get rid of that misconception right off the bat. Uh, the issue is, is very complex. It's a very deep issue and it's a very emotional issue. And so in order to do it justice, we have to approach it carefully. Mm -hmm. The question is, what do we believe about this marvelous book? This is the King James Version, which is my current Bible. And it wasn't always my current Bible. Okay. I started off with the NIV and I studied the NIV and I have about two NIVs that are totally disintegrating. Yeah. And it is through a process of, of, let's say, growth that I realized that there were so many anomalies in these translations that I moved on to a Bible that was more based on the received text and that happened to be the New King James. Mm -hmm. So I have a, a number of New King James which have gone through a similar process and eventually I am now at the received text in the King James version. Now, why is that and why this progression? Modern translations, and this is by the admittance of the publishers and the committees that Very produce wise. them, are what we call eclectic texts. Mm. Now, an eclectic text takes information from various thinkers from all over the world and collects them and this becomes to them what the Word of God says. Now, how do we approach the Word of God? Is it an inspired book? 
uh, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth God. of the Lord. Yes. So we must know, you know, is this the word of God? Yes. Now, an eclectic text uh, can contain the word of God, mm. but that doesn't mean that it is the word of God. Yeah. I would like to know what did God say and not what did someone think God said. Yes. There's a vast difference. And if we, if we look at the approach that we have in the world out there, there are thousands of different varieties of what people think God said. Yes. So it's like getting things second hand, third hand, and via how many sources, and eventually you don't know what was God's word and what was not God's word. So I want to have a Bible that is a direct translation of what God said. If I want to know what some particular individual, be he respected or not in the world, has to say, I can always go and look it up in his comments on the Bible or in a Bible commentary. But first and foremost, I want to know what did God say? Yes. And then I want to be able to communicate with the God that I believe inspired this book and say to him, Lord, help me to understand this book. I want to know what you have said. And if I base my study on that, then I can trust in the fact that the Holy Spirit will help me. Yes. If I get stuck with something, in the counsel of many there is wisdom. And I can look at what various people have to say about these issues, but I want to know what he said. Now, there's one thing to say that this book is inspired, mm -hmm. but inspiration without preservation is totally useless. Yes. Because if the original autograph was inspired and it wasn't preserved, then how do I know that this is the Word of God? Yes. It could be gobbledygook, right? Yeah, correct. <laughs> I want to know, is this the inspired Word of God? Now, are there not promises in the Bible where the Bible clearly tells us that this is not only an inspired book, where holy men were moved by the Spirit of God, but that it is a preserved book. Yeah. And it's a covenant. And it's a covenant. Now, this is very important. Now, a covenant is an agreement between parties. And this book, the Bible, is a covenant between God and man. And we need to know exactly what this covenant entails and who is affected by the covenant. Yes. So let us say that the Bible is not only uh, the thoughts of God, it's not only the words of God, but it is a legal document. It is a covenant. And legal documents have certain criteria. Mm -hmm. For example, if you purchase a property, can you just purchase the property or must there be witnesses yes. to witness to the fact that you have covenanted to purchase this property? Yes. There must be witnesses. Mm -hmm. All right. Is one witness enough? No. No. You have to have more than one witness, yes. at least two. At least right? two. So even the Bible says by Two. The word of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. established. So you need witnesses. So a legal document has witnesses. Uh, what else does uh, a legal document have to have? It has to have very precise uh, information as to exactly who is involved mm -hmm. in this legal document. If you, for example, set up a will, Yes. and you very vaguely talk about how everything is to be distributed, it'll be very confusing to those who actually have to implement the will, right? Yes, correct. So, 
how precise must it be? You must know exactly who it is referring to yes. and who is being spoken about. Now, in, in uh, high court legal documents, very often, uh, they are written in a very specific way. It's interesting that in some of these very important legal documents, I'm not talking about general uh, legal issues on you know public level, I'm talking about really important high court issues. Uh, for example, there's no punctuation. Uh, interesting. Yes, because a comma in the wrong place can influence a person to think in a particular Correct. direction. Yeah. Whereas if there is no punctuation, then you have to defer or infer from the information that is provided who the parties are without prejudice. Now, a beautiful example in the Bible is, Verily, verily, I say unto you today, yes. you shall be with me in the kingdom of heaven, or verily, verily, I say unto you today, Today you will be in the kingdom of heaven. The comma yes. is very important as to where it is placed because it changes the entire theology. Now the original autographs didn't have that kind Any of punctuation. punctuation. Yes. So that is precisely what you would find in a legal document. Now, why do I like the King James? I phrased that carefully. <laughs> I'm not a King James only. Yes. But why do I like the King James? I like the King James because it is phrased in this legal language. Besides having a legal language, it is also uh, a poetic language. Yes. It is probably the greatest literary masterpiece ever written. Yes. And it has it has managed to retain uh, some of the beauty of the Hebrew and the Greek parallelism. parallelism and the poetry yes. that goes along with it. And there is no other translation that has retained it as the King James has. Not only that, it, because it is a word-for-word -word, uh, translation with the retention of the poetic structure, which, which is in itself a miracle. miracle. Uh, you can have chiastic yes. structures, and chiastic structures are often based on repetition yes. to, to fit in certain ideas and to highlight certain portions of the scripture. And the Hebrew is, is totally written in chiastic yes. structure. The Bible, in fact, in the Old and the New Testament, has these attributes. And now there are people that say that the King James or the received text is an expanded text. Yeah, yes, correct. Now, <laughs> why is it an expanded text? Because the manuscripts that the modern translations are based upon are shorter. All right, so are they now the criterion, or is the other one the criterion? Why don't we ever hear people say the modern ones are uh, reduced text? No, this is an expanded text, so the other one automatically becomes the norm. Mm -hmm. What if it's the other way around? Well, they, what if this is the original and the other one is a shrunken text? Yes. Uh, why would there be so many repetitions? For example, if you go to the book of Revelation and it talks about I am the Alpha and the Omega and it has a lot of things and it ends with I am the Alpha and the Omega, many modern people say, well, this is needless repetition. Mm -hmm. Take it out. Once is enough. Well, excuse me, you have just destroyed a chiasm yes. by removing it. So. Is the expanded one the correct one, or is the contracted one the correct one? In my opinion, this is not an expanded text, this is the original, original. text. Uh, now, what else is important in a covenant? Well, you were speaking now about received text. Yes. What is the difference between received text and the 
texts that they use to do modern translations on? There are basically two streams of manuscripts in the world out there. The one is the Byzantine text, and the other one is the Egyptian uh, Alexandrian, Alexandrian. Uh, texts. And there are about 45 manuscripts, basically, that they have found in the deserts of Egypt. And uh, it's amazing to me that people will say that God has preserved his word in the deserts of Egypt. And we have now, at the end of time here, dug them up and found his word. That is the most ridiculous statement I have ever heard in my life. The Byzantine text is the text that was used at Antioch for example, yeah. where the first church was. And from there it spread to the entire world, even as far as um, India and yeah. China and all of those, and, and then made its way into Europe. And uh, this was the text that was used by the early church. Correct. Now the Alexandrian version, it was used in Alexandria and in Rome. Yes. And does Rome now become the modern harbour, now that Alexandria no longer exists, yes. of this word that was found in the desert? Yeah. Now, does God preserve his word in the desert sand for some future generation to dig up in a mouldy fashion and read? Or does he preserve it by implanting it in the minds of men throughout every generation? This is a very important issue. Yeah, because me. what happened to the people in that period that it wasn't discovered in the desert, so exactly. were they then without a text? Then God left them without a witness. Mm. That doesn't make any sense. Mm. And then who is the harborer of God's word? Is it the proud hierarchy in Rome? Mm. Or, or, was it, or was it that the, the word of God came via the Byzantines into Europe uh, by people that were closely associated with the apostles from the beginning and were the, the ones who nurtured and kept the word of God alive yeah. in, in the minds of men. And who were prepared to die for that word exactly. that they had in their hands. And, uh, you know, we have a source which is called the Spirit of Prophecy. And the Spirit of Prophecy tells us very clearly who were the ones that had the word of God yes. unadulterated. Yeah. It was the Valdensians. The Vaudois. The Vaudois. So now there's this argument, oh, but they, you know, they are a very late arrival, and they talk about Peter, Peter Waldo, Waldo and all this. No, no, they can be traced back to the first and second century. Yeah. And you would have to deny those writings in order to change that view. Uh, so perhaps I can read to yes. you a statement regarding this issue. Here's one that comes from HF 45 paragraph 1. The Vaudor churches resembled the church of apostolic times. Rejecting the supremacy of the Pope and prelate, they held the Bible as the only infallible authority. Their pastors, unlike the lordly priests of Rome, fed the flock of God, leaving them to green pastures and living fountains of his holy word. The people assembled, not in magnificent churches or grand cathedrals, but in the alpine valleys or in time of danger in some rocky stronghold, to listen to the words of truth from the servants of Christ. The pastors not only preached the gospel, they visited the sick and labored to promote harmony and brotherly love. Like Paul, the tent maker each learned some trade by which, if necessary, to provide for his own support. In paragraph uh, 1 of page 43 it says, Their religious belief was founded upon the written word of God. Those humble peasants, shut away from the world, had not by themselves arrived at truth in opposition to the dogmas of the apostate church. Their religious belief was their inheritance from their fathers. 
They contended for the faith of the apostolic church, the church in the wilderness, and not the proud hierarchy enthroned in the world's great capital was the church of Christ, the guardian of the treasures of truth which God committed to his people to be given to the world. So who were the ones that had these uh, manuscripts on which they based the word of God? Yeah. They were the Valdensians. So you have these two streams, and there are thousands of documents that have been copied painstakingly and carefully over centuries, which constitute the received text. Yes. Uh, of course, because they were used. Yes. Because they were incorporated into the thinking of, of men, the original autographs are not there. And so now the argument is, well, then they must be faulty because by repeated copying, uh, they must have been changed. Yeah. But don't you negate God's promise to preserve his word then? Absolutely. If you believe in inspiration, you must believe in preservation. Absolutely. Now let's take a look at the, at the flagships of the Alexandrian line. Yeah. It's the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus. Sinaiticus. Now, the one was found in the library of the Vatican just in time to refute the, the Bible version that Martin Luther produced based on the received text. And on that you have the Douay version, yes. which is uh, the Jesuit version. And by the way, the Jesuits hated this word of God. They called it this poisonous ass. They hated it with a passion. Yes. And they produced the Douay, which has Mary crushing the head of the serpent rather than Christ. And it's a totally spurious version. And uh, on, on that document, on the Vaticanus, obviously was also based the earlier Vulgate yes. by Jerome. And then, of course, when this modern uh, move came, they needed manuscripts other than those, to base their, their translations upon. And then they found the Sineticus yes. in St. Catherine's in monastery. monastery. Yes, and Tischendorf found it there. Yes. Where did he find it? In a dust In a waste paper basket. Now it's fascinating that... Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, Sorry, hurry. and he also didn't find the complete one the first time. No, he had to go back several he had, times. Uh, yes, he had to go back several times to discover new manuscripts. And why would this <laughs> Protestant dedicate it to the Pope? Yeah. This makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. And this, this one was found, and it doesn't contain the first portions of the Bible, and it doesn't contain the last portions of the Bible. The book of Revelation is completely gone. And, uh, I mean, Westcott and Hort later referred to these, to the Vaticanus, as an ocean of purity. When they found this manuscript, there were so many portions that had been scratched out and changed and rewritten. The whole document was uh, plastered with changes. Now, is this indicative of God's word that is changeless? Uh, my opinion was that it was found in a waste paper basket mm -hmm. and it should have stayed there because that is where, in my opinion, it belonged. I mean, the Epistle of Barnabas, uh, the most pathetic biological document I've ever read in my life, which has the hyena changing sex and, and animals like the weasel giving birth through the mouth. I mean, if, if, if that is what is part of an inspired document, then the whole document, in my opinion, is spurious. But the fact of the matter is that all modern translations yes. are basically based on those two flagships, yeah. with a couple of uncles that have been found in those deserts. And uh, two individuals, Westcott and Hort. Mm. Now, it's fascinating to me that these individuals were, of course, Protestant. Protestant. And uh, what a clever idea to use Protestants to bring in this documentation upon which modern Bibles are uh, based. 
So they took basically those two documents and uh, produced a Greek text mm. for the New Testament upon which all modern Bibles are based. Now, these gentlemen were as far removed from Protestantism as the East is from the West. In their own writings, yes. they condemned themselves. They were Mariologists, yes. number one. They believed in evolution. They were evolutionists. Yes. They despised the received text. Yes. They wrote in the most derogatory fashion about the received text. And uh, these are the documents on which all modern Bibles are oh, basically based. based. Mm. Now let's go back to the King James Bible, which was the Protestant version. Now I never started with the King James. Uh, the first translation was Tyndall's translation. Yeah. And Tyndall also, like Martin Luther, used the received text. And then this Bible uh, was taken together with other manuscripts that came, by the way, from the Waldensians. Mm -hmm. And in Geneva, where the Protestants were exiled, they produced Bible translation. One of the first ones, by the way, was the French translation, to which the Douay was actually the counter. And it was based on Valdensian manuscripts. And the Geneva Bible, the English version, was based on Tyndall's translation and Coverdale, and, and they produced the Geneva Bible, which was the Bible of choice yes. for Protestants, for many, many years. Yes. In fact, people were very uh, uninclined to give it up. They loved the Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible had a problem for Catholicism, though, mm. because it had such <laughs> very straightforward footnotes. Oh, okay. And those footnotes revealed exactly who was who in the zoo. They made no bones about calling the papacy Antichrist, for example, and showing who the little horn was, etc., or the beasts of Revelation. And the English also was Old English, like Chaucer English, okay. which was... And the English language had changed considerably by the time you get to King the King James, James in 1611. And what happened was that it was decided to make a translation, bringing it up to the more modern English that was spoken. It's like Shakespearean English okay. at that time. And uh, King James then gave the permission not that he was such a religious person, but it's called the King James because he gave permission. Yes. But there were to be no footnotes. So that's, that's interesting in the first place. But what, what is interesting about the King James is that the committee that actually put it together, they were all Protestants. Yes. And they were believing Protestants. And they believed that this was the word of God. Yes. And they had numerous translators. And they lived in various portions of the country. Yes. And when they, when they translated a verse, then there had to be harmony in the translations so that it was only incorporated into the Bible if everybody was on the same page. Yes. They weren't cut off and isolated. They could consult scholars. It wasn't Even the, the public could absolutely. have insight. Um, Input. Yes, it's amazing how it was put together. And they will tell us that this is archaic language. And this is a very fascinating point. And I would like us to continue on that point in our next episode as our time is up for now. We haven't even started. Yes, so that's why we have to continue with this discussion. Thank you for watching. We will be back with the next episode of What's Up Prof. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click and you will receive notifications. To watch the next one, click here. Thank you again and see you next time.